Hello everyone and welcome to episode 27 of 6 Out of 7 Podcast. I'm Liam. And I'm Alan. There's no Callum. He's travelling the world. Where's he off to? Uh, I don't even know. I think I think he's in Edinburgh. He's looking for a job or something. Part of the Fringe. He might be performing at the Fringe. You don't know that guy. Um, so, I don't know if he'll be... I don't think he's back next week actually. So, might be Alan again next week. Maybe me again. We could talk be. about some things. So, we're going to talk about Hobbs and Shaw. That's what this episode's going to be. Absolutely love Hobbs and Shaw. Did you like it? No, it was it was definitely the weakest of the the, the franchise. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Uh huh. Yeah. It was the weakest of definitely the weakest. I, I nine felt, films. I felt bored when I was watching it. I've heard two is really bad. Two is bad, but in a kind of good way. Mm-hmm. It's like it's very over the top and it's very cartoonish. But so is Hobbs and Shaw. So it's like I, I don't know what went wrong with both, but it's like I find Hobbs and Shaw to be like a Saturday morning cartoon show. Yeah. Where like. Team Rocket are blasting off again, or like uh, it's like GI Joe, where mm. there's like so much like super spies and weird technology, and it's just it's bad. Yeah, it's just a really bad thing. No way, it copied Mission Impossible Two. It did copy Mission Impossible. There was, a, there was a bit of that. It was less good than Mission Impossible Two. Mission Impossible Two is like the crazy one. Was that the one with Tandy Newton? Aye, right. That was. Is that how you say her name? I thought it was like Fandy. Fandy Newton. Fandy. Nah, definitely Tandy Newton. Um, I it was it was it was fine. It was. It was what it was. I don't know. It's the, it was the first one I'd seen. I'd now seen Fast and Furious 1. Right, so if you've seen Hobbs and Shaw, go back, watch Fast and Furious 1, watch Tokyo Drift, mm-hmm. and watch Fast 5. They're like the three main ones that Seriously? you Seriously? Yeah. I thought 7 was good as well. Is that S- not the one seven, he dies in? 7 is good because it's like the whole send-off to Paul Walker. Uh, it's like, but I think 7 is only good if you've seen like all the other ones because mm-hmm. obviously like Paul Walker is such an integral part of that. And it's such an emotional send-off as well because Paul Walker really wasn't in like a ton of stuff. Uh-huh. Like he had Fast and Furious, and then he had like bit parts in like the nineties as like a villain, like a really like. Uh, do you ever watch Skulls? Skulls no. is a weird film where it's it's like a fraternity movie, but they're all like secret societies. But he plays like a really uppity young man from money who's like mm-hmm. the main villain. He's pretty okay in that, to be honest. Yeah. He's charismatic in the first one that I watched today. It was like he's yeah. he's not bad. He definitely does. Stretch. He definitely does like the tuna there. Yeah, no crusts. <laughs> no crusts. Um, it's yeah. The first one are they the same? Because when I was watching Hobbs and Shaw, I was like, I was just thinking, because Heather, who I work with, I don't know if she listens, but she loves it, yeah. and she always goes on, and she's like, I really like Fast and Furious, that's like her thing. The, the first one is the best one. Yeah, but I was like, is Helen Mirren in the other ones? Helen Mirren is in the eighth one. <laughs> oh my god. And, no, just the eighth one. Uh-huh. She's like the, the mum. Yeah, so she's the same character. I, I, I feel like she might be playing the same character that she does in Remember Red's. Right, okay. She was in Red 2, wasn't she, with Bruce Willis? I oh. think it might be the same person. Oh my god. There's like a whole sort of like Fast and Furious cinematic un- like franchise. They should. Shameless. Why it's not? Nice. Just connect them all. Um, and Ryan Reynolds is. he's That's the only one he's in. This is the first film where Ryan Reynolds is part of it. He was dreadful. Awful. He's, he's basically playing awful. Deadpool. That's the only character who doesn't. I hate that that's what he's. That's his role now. Uh, same when like Kevin Hart turns up out of nowhere. I like that. Yeah, but he does play Kevin Hart. Like yeah, but that was fit because Kevin Hart's kind of funny. He's kind of funny. In small doses. In small doses. Uh, he's good in Jumanji, and that's about it. But yeah. I don't really like him in anything Looking else. forward to Jumanji too. Oh, I can't wait. Is that this year or next? I think it's this Christmas. Cause it, like, Has the trailer been out? <laughs> the trailer came out in Comic-Con, I think. Right, okay. Because uh, I think it's, what, two years since the first Jumanji came out? Is mm-hmm. it one year? Two years? Two. Fuck no. Two years, I'm sure. Uh, Two years, yeah. Because what was it? Like? Aquaman was the film yeah, last Aquaman year. Was How bad is that? Aqu- That's where we're at. It's just a bad time. Yeah. Bad time for Hollywood. Bad time for cinema. Um, Imagine being a nerd in 2018. That's what we all are, Alan. We're doing podcasts. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, there was things that I liked about it and things I didn't like. I thought the script was terrible. They, they talk about balls. Th- they're balls all yeah, the time. Like, let, take a drink every time yeah. you mention it and you'll be hammered. It's, it's worse than... Then it's worse in Hobbs and Shaw when they talk about balls than it is in Fast and Furious and they talk about family. Like, uh, right, okay. It's it's equivalent. Uh, it's all throughout the film and it's just it's too much. Mm-hmm. It's it's there's more homoeroticism in this film than there is in Top Gun. <laughs> yeah, I can't. Yeah, I can't really disagree. I thought when spoilers, Jason Statham's character's sister right. gets with the Rock, I was like, put her down. Yes. Because they have a wee kiss on a mountaintop and I was like, you look about 30 years older than her. <laughs> That's fucking grim. She's great in it. She, uh, she is great. Well, 
Was she not in Vanessa Kirby? Was she not in the last Mission Impossible yeah. film? She has a wee action scene in the, the she, bar. She's the the arm stealer, isn't she? She's really good in that. She's thing. got a very symmetrical face. She does have a very symmetrical face. Yes. Uh, do you know who also has a symmetrical face that isn't actually in the film? <laughs> that Russian lady that is What was that about, man? <laughs> is that for the mar- is that for marketing? She, she, it must be, because she's all over the posters, yeah. but she's literally in the film for two minutes. She is front and centre in the poster. She's there, but she's not there. Yeah. Not. She gets a wee smooch. Just get a smooch. Of uh, Hobbs or Shaw. Don't know what one Jason Statham is. It's J- uh, Jason Statham is Shaw. Right. And then that's it, really? Yeah. They're like, that's, that's, and then she's she's off. She'll sure, come back for the second one. Yeah, well, this is, it felt, when the computer talks to them at the end, yeah. and it's like, basically like, twirling its moustache and saying, I'll be back. Right, so, you know I mean? is it a spoiler, right? I thought that voice was going to be Ryan Reynolds. It, it sounds like Ryan Reynolds to me, like, if you were to, like, digitally manipulate the voice. My God. Imagine the twist. I mean, it would have been fine. It, I, I feel like Ryan Reynolds should have been the villain all along in this film. Because he's so annoying. He is so annoying, but then like he has like some sort of backstory with like uh, Hobbs, which it doesn't like get explained at mm-hmm. all. What one's Hobbs? Hobbs is uh, the, the rock. rock. Right, cool. Okay. Well, that was what I was confused about as well, because Idris Elba, all the way through it, to Jason Statham, Hobbs or Shaw, he, was, he kept saying to him, <laughs> Hobbs slash Shaw, you shot me, you bad man. Just, like, and I was like, is this in the other ones? No. Or? Right, okay. It's, 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 it comes out of nowhere. Like, Idris Elba like, comes up and says, oh, you shot me twice in the chest and once in the head, just like we were trained because we're like <laughs> hardened SAS soldiers. Yeah. But then they don't go into details of like the mission. <laughs> like, it, it just, it's it's there to establish that they, they knew each other and yeah, that's sure. it. SAS or something? It's, it's presumably the SAS. What's it, The Rock's job? It's just a secret agent. For, but would, for what? To so what it's, end? It's, it's DFS? No, DSS. <laughs> DFS, is that not a word that you're that's, up? <laughs> that's, a, that's definitely, he's, he's just trying to sell some sofas. Yeah, that's why he's in the fight. He doesn't yeah. need to, that guy maybe, must be so rich. Maybe that's why he was after Vin Diesel, because he was stealing DVD players and he's yeah. upgraded. I really liked that in the first one, they are literally stealing like DVD, <laughs> and the guy goes like, it's over one million. Over he's one stolen the, the amount of DVDs. It's, uh, over one million DVD players. Yeah, it's incredible. Man. You couldn't sell that for 50p these days. But I thought it was okay. It was okay. It was enjoyable. It was, it was a dumb action movie. Yeah. Did yeah. you like it a bit in Glasgow? Right. So I had a bit of like sort of cognitive dissonance with the bits in Glasgow because mm-hmm. obviously like you see cars going down the streets and you see geography that you're familiar with and then in the background it's been digitally edited to not be that geography anymore. So I was just looking at it, I'm like, that's not what like St. Vincent Street looks like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all I could focus on when the actual action like set piece yeah, was sure. happening. And it was also like a dumb action set piece. There was like bikes that like transformed into like, That was proper shit. Yeah, like, like I just held this bike. I, I just kinda miss when it was like Fast and Furious where it was just like, This is a car and nothing else. Smashing into another car. Yeah. Mm. But it's even the same during I think it's like Fast and Furious Six where uh, Vin Diesel like throws a car at a tank, mm-hmm. and it's just it's still just a car. It's not like a transformer. Like yeah, well they're going they're going wild now. They can because this is he's like a super soldier. Yeah, to some extent. Do you know he's credited as Black Superman? What like his what's his character? What's his character name is Black Bri- Superman? Brixton Lore slash Black Superman. Like that's his that's... character name. Yeah. How do you feel about that? I'm just I'm not surprised to be honest, but he. If they want to credit him as that, that's fair enough. Yeah, um, but... I feel, I feel like it was a very tenuous joke during the film, at best. But he says it and then The Rock's like, he really is Black Superman, yeah, and but it's, it's, that's it's not, his character's name. I think it would have been like more interesting if like maybe his suit first opened at some point, maybe they had an S. Yeah, like some, like I mean, it's that kind of film, yeah. you could have got away with it. Something a bit more like corny, or like just something less like, oh, I'm just going to repeat this joke again. Mm-hmm. And I, I feel like... Because it was so cartoonish, like they had like an opportunity to make it just so weird and kind of just batshit. Yeah. That they kind of just didn't really go for that that much. Yeah, sure. I mean, like going from obviously that's one is the first one I've seen all the way through, like to that. Even one's a bit silly at yeah. points, but yeah, they're just going off. I assume from here, it's basically they a science fiction film. At this yeah, point. they can do what they want, and I I'll probably go and see them. Like get some cars in space. Yeah. Why not? Why not? Why the hell not? I thought they were okay together, like as. Uh, but when they had like the when they were talking about each other's balls and like <laughs> kicking each other's he, balls he's, he's up with like, a bum the rock like, yeah, yeah I was just it was quite like mm, this is a bit grating to it's, me it's when they're in the interrogation room and they're just staring each other down mm-hmm. and they're just saying your face is the worst face I have ever seen in my life <laughs> did you like that? no I right, hate good. this so much yeah, because yeah. it was just it feels it feels like 
that was improv mm-hmm. and just like oh go ahead and just yeah. hate each other well The Rock's a producer on it yeah. so yeah he probably has been like nah we'll add this in like because it's, it's like it just, I, I, feel, I feel like the line I'm going to kick you so far up your butt you're going to be coughing up shoelaces mm-hmm. was used about four times yeah. throughout the entire film and I'm pretty sure I've heard it in other Fast and Furious films it feels like they're just recycling like jargon or like yeah. just lines and it's like I'm not into it whereas like at least Fast and Furious 1 to 5 were sort of semi kind of like original mm-hmm. even though the Fast and Furious 1 is based off of Point Break yeah it at least did something new with the concept yeah well that's the thing can you remember any action scene from it like can you remember one part where you're like that was cool what from Hobbs and Shaw no not really uh, other than like the the George Square stuff only because I'm like oh that's George Square it's George Square there's the Greggs yeah the, that George Square uh, yeah that was the one that I really remember yeah, I don't yeah. remember any other action set piece other than maybe like Chernobyl other than because it was Chernobyl mm-hmm. like I remember the locations but not actually what happened yeah so a, a wee bit dull I would say for like the, the subject matter and what's happening this crazy car chase is happening yeah. but you come out of it and you're like did I even see that film like, I, I need to go back and rewatch Mission Impossible 2 it's really put me in the mood for yeah, it to be honest definitely man Degree Scott Degree Scott put a sock in it <laughs> uh, just, it cost 2 million uh, 200 million 2 million that's yeah. and I don't know man it's been marketed for what seems like about a year so they're really going to need to make their money back well, we're going to get spin-offs and spin-offs now, so now we're going to have... Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart. In a plane. Ryan Reynolds. We're going to have... Not Ryan Reynolds. The whole sort of expanded Hobbs and Shaw universe. Yeah. Uh, Roman Reigns gets his own film. Roman Reigns gets... I'd like. I'd, I'd watch it. Yeah. See if it just starts spearing people. I'd watch a film that was the uh, Hobbs' brother. Mm-hmm. The guy that's played by... What? He's played by the New Zealand guy. Oh, I don't know. I, I don't, don't know I don't, that guy I, from I, I, I thought his brother was going to be Roman Reigns. What, he's, he's from New Zealand, but right, I, I can't remember his actual name. Uh, and they do a hacker. That was kind of cool. Yeah. I was like, oh some cultural appropriation yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I like that though like I like, like embrace the Simone roots yeah, Dwayne true. Johnson just get Roman Reigns and more stuff well he was literally in every scene that he could have been in all, all this he cut, was all this cut away footage to yeah. Roman Reigns just like shaking uh, his head like see the fact that they go to Samoa though and the fact that they like added Roman Reigns why not add also Samoa Joe yeah who's actually Simone yeah you know what I mean like, just get, get them all in there the Usos Usos yeah I think he was just done with another DUI though oh was he I mean, yeah it's not the best then. like a few days ago so probably not the best but yeah shall we move on yeah, let's move on let's move on so music biopics music. I, got, I got some questions before we start right so what is the general what is your general opinion on music biopics obviously that leads into the bigger favourites but what like when you see who, who's going to be next probably Bowie Bowie Bassett will be in the next I, couple I of years get, I think we'll get Aretha Franklin one yeah probably get the Rolling Stones at some point maybe maybe even just Mick Jagger by yeah, himself yeah. Uh, but if you've seen that say we went to the cinema today and you've seen that trailer would you be like eh it's, it's a bit of burnout so far just now, isn't it like, it's all part of the bigger musical cinematic universe it's, they basically became like the new Avengers uh-huh. like they're all going to team up and they're all going to take down big money studios aren't they do you think You've seen Rocket Man. Do you want to start off with Rocket Man? Yeah, let's start with Rocket Man. But I've not seen it. You've not seen so it. So I don't it's really. Actual, actual rubbish. Uh-huh. It's it's completely self-aggrandized, kind of narcissistic, produced by Elton John, because he had to get his his, his life story out there somehow. Because what actually happened to Elton John during his lifetime? Yes. I don't know. There's 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 no great sort of big. Did trauma. you not learn that in the film? Not really. Other than like him being like a like a drug addict and uh-huh. an alcoholic. Like there's not really that. It's not a great kind of catastrophic moment that's part of his life story. And that is kind of like apparent throughout the entire film because it's just him engaging in acts of debauchery, taking drugs, hating his mum. Mm-hmm. And that's it. That's the entire film and it's awful. Uh, I'm not actually that familiar with like the Elton John like story. Not even the story, just the music in general. Right, okay. I, like, I like Crocodile Rock. I like Benny and the Jets. don't know any other tunes. And you know, like your song and yeah, but the hits, yeah, the hits. Uh, but you know what I mean? It's like, see, when an Elton John song starts, it takes me away well from like that's Elton John. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's rubbish just because Taron Egerton isn't really that great an actor, he can't really carry a film by himself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was directed by Dexter Fletcher, who also directed uh, Eddie the Eagle. You're right, okay. kind of like another biopic movie, but it's sure. also rubbish mm-hmm. just because it's also Taron Egerton and he can't carry a film. They actually had to get Hugh Jackman in there to be like as some star star mm-hmm. whereas like there's none of that here I think the biggest actress or actor that's in Rocket Man is Jamie Bell who is Bernie Taupin is that his manager or his, that's his like, songwriter that's his lyricist right, so yeah. that's the person that like, comes up with the lyrics to his music uh, 
and British Dallas Howard who is actually doing her best uh, kind of attempt at a Dick Van Dyke Cockney accent seriously so, I mean, it's awful I hate it it's, Jesus man she's hamming up the screen every two, two seconds she's on it and it's just not an interesting story and that's the reason why Rocket Man is a bit crap mm-hmm do you have any like, thoughts what is the general consensus on it because obviously like Bohemian Rhapsody people are like let's talk about Bohemian Rhapsody because it's like when I seen it I was like this is okay like three quarters of it I was like this is okay and then the Live Aid scene came yeah. and I've like gushed about that enough the Live Aid scene is great in Bohemian Rhapsody but there's nothing like that in Rocket Man right, okay. uh, actually no, there is a kind of small part of it that is actually okay and it's the part where it's actually at the end of the film I think maybe the credits mm-hmm. but Taron Edgerton uh, is in a music video that recreates the I'm Still Standing kind of part of it and it's great because it's like it's something that you know it's just a music video that's like iconic mm-hmm. and it's this sort of like kind of part where you can like it's just joyous uh, whereas like the rest of the film is incredibly forget- uh, forgettable he touches a piano and then he can immediately play it Yeah, there's no character arc there he's immediately a gifted songwriter and he continues being a gifted songwriter that just does drugs to yeah. the film and that's it it's not interesting at all it's just a bit Bit dull. Yeah, that's what I think. I don't know. That's the way it seems that they're going with these. It's. I think maybe it's the Greatest Showman a little bit. A little bit is where like they don't have time for like the actual someone trying to write a song and like getting a band together and, and being quite shit yeah, at they, the start. They need got, it to be good. They've got to bring out an album yeah. that goes along with the film just so they can like make a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That happens in like Human Rhapsody as well though. Like. I really don't like the first 40, like the first seventy five percent of Human Rhapsody. Mm-hmm. It's just the live aid scene. Yeah, the live aid scene is incredible. Uh, just because it's like I feel like that's what they had to start with. They were like, we're going to do the live aid scene. We're yeah. going to get someone to be Freddie Mercury, and we're going to build a movie around it. Work our way back. Because like that's, the, yeah. I'm, I'm angry. I'm no, no, no. I, like, I, I, like, when he gets on stage and he plays with Queen for the first time yeah. and Human Rhapsody, they are like great immediately. And I just I don't think you really you need that like I like in a music biopic where like Control is a really good one for that because when they play their first gig like when he comes he comes out late and they can barely play they can barely play you can hear it and like the the actors are actually playing their instruments you know what I mean this is where like a a biopic that comes out for like Sonic Youth where Mm -hmm. it's like they they didn't know how to play initially and they were like actually just trying to find new ways to play their instruments like even like Sex Pistols I would watch a Sex Pistols biopic Uh, maybe not so much like Sid and Nancy but Definitely, like one that's more about the, the group and how mm-hmm. they come together. Uh, the issue with like being Rhapsody though is like, as much as Remy Malik kind of like personifies that character, his actual like personality traits I think are like n- not the best way to put forward Freddie Mercury because I, th- I think Freddie Mercury was like a genius, mm-hmm. whereas like Remy Malik portrays him as like a child. Yeah, he's like a caricature. Yeah, he's an actual caricature. He's he's he doesn't have any sort of like uh, oh what's the words? I don't know. Uh, he doesn't have any idea of what the consequences of his actions are, mm-hmm. and it just makes him look like he's just travel like rattling through life. Yeah, absolutely. Like doesn't give a shit about anything. Mm-hmm. When really, probably Freddie Mercury knew a lot about what he was doing. He yeah, he's probably Compass Menace. But I think it was like as well with Bohemian Rhapsody is it sh- it gives you a wee glimpse because it's a twelve A gives you a wee it's glimpse. A See when the guy's going in, he's like a trucker and he goes into the they're touring America for the first time and he like looks at Freddie and like goes into the, the toilet and it's meant to be as if like oh he's on the phone to is it Nancy? What do you say? Is Mary. He, Mary. Mary. Oh he says that enough doesn't he? <laughs> and um, it's like oh like is he going to stay on the phone or is he going to go in and like have like gay do, sex for the first time? Do, do you reckon the upcoming George Michael biopic is going to be two hours of that? <laughs> Just him hanging around a truck stop? Is that coming? Like, is Probably. That... It's got to be coming surely. Jesus man. Imagine the George Michael biopic. But it depends who does it. See yeah. if it's done respectfully and... I didn't know that. Does he need... A... Does he? Who knows? It's a bad time. Well, that... Did Elton John need one? Did Elton John need one? These are all good questions. Like, do we really need biopics about, like, you know, people that don't really have that much turmoil in their life story? Well, right. Let, let's go... By the, so, Walk the Line. We both like Walk the Line. It's on the best list. I think it is the best. It's the best. Maybe, maybe not the best. It's a bit list. long. Yeah, there are, there are issues with the middle part where, like, it is just him kind of going back and forth with June Carter. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that could be, like, cut half of that out. Yeah, but, like, I, I think if you start cutting out parts of Walk the Line, it starts turning into, like, what Bohemian Rhapsody and Rocket Man are, where it is just, like, hit after hit yeah, after hit. Yeah, like, it, nothing wrong with It becomes, like, a jukebox musical mm-hmm. at that point where just play the hits, release an album, yeah. make the money. Uh, whereas, like, with Walk the Line, like, 
you do actually get a sense of who Johnny Cash was, mm-hmm. whereas like I don't think you really get that with like Rocket Man. Sure. Yeah, that, like it's it goes like obviously like his childhood and then losing his brother and like the whole thing with his father. Like there's a lot. I think there's a lot in it. Like yeah. it's got the family issues, it's got the romance like issues, yeah, and then it's definitely. got the drug problems and it's got great music. So there's a lot going on. Um, Walk the Line might have my favourite opening to a music biopic ever and it's like when he's actually the man in black in Folsom Prison mm-hmm. and he's just staring at the, the buzzsaw yeah. and he's just like kind of rubbing his finger yeah. over it like almost like cutting himself and then we get the transition into his like life story with his brother who mm-hmm. actually like, lost did he die because of the accident? He, he cut himself in his side and then yeah. he died of his yeah. injuries it's, it's crazy it's, like, it's a very sad story but there's Dewey Cox which is <laughs> fucking hilarious I've said that in the podcast before but there's a funny like it's basically a parody of Walk the Line because it came out like maybe a year apart and he's about to play like the Hall of Fame and he's doing the whole thing he's like got his hand against right. the wall and he's thinking and someone shouts he's like Dewey Cox time to perform and then his drummer comes out and he says Dewey Cox he's got to think about his whole life before he performs and that's like <laughs> right. it's a funny like it's a funny joke on it but yeah it's a really I never even thought about that like see I, I've never really like I've never seen Dewey Cox mm. I was I was thought I'll like, give you it after <laughs> I'll give you it after. But uh, I always thought it was an Elvis like parody. I didn't realize it was Johnny Cash. Jack White's Elvis in it, right? And he like, so he, he like mumbles to the point you can't understand him, right. and uh, it's really very very good. It's very good. Oh. But um, yeah, I think it's really, it's just very very good. The only the only thing that I don't like about it is the length. The length. Well, I think you need the length. I think you need the length there to like have a have a mood. Uh, otherwise, there's no like sort of descent into like. His alcoholism. There's no descent into his addiction. There's no descent into like, just his sort of like, bad time. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? It's like he's, he's he's there's a whole thing in like film studies where you call it it's the, it's the darkest cave, and I think without the length of it, you don't get the sort of like sense of he was really really in a bad place at that mm-hmm. time. Uh, I think if you cut out a huge chunk of it, you do get into the the Great Showman issue, where there's always a there's a cut in the Great Showman which really really annoys me, and it's like when the how is it the the red headed one the the, the opera singer right. she says oh we're going to go to London and meet Queen Victoria and then there's a cut and they're there immediately yeah. and it just feels so out of place because they're in America and then next time they're in London it's a musical like you can't compare you can't I love The Greatest Showman but you can't be like it's just there to be enjoyed is it, don't like, read too much into it I do enjoy it but it just it does, it does annoy me I wish mm. there was even like a wee five minute gap just them on a train how would you like a train or a you, boat? Could, you could have a musical number a bit yeah, of you could li- literally do so much but Great Showman's good. Don't, good. don't 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 speak ill of the Great Showman. Is that a biopic? Well, it's about P.T. Barnum, isn't it? Yeah, who's an absolute monster. He's a monster. It's a fantasy. It's a fairy tale. No matter what, I wish that was Disney, because when you go to Disneyland, there could be like a, well, like a, like a an actual event of it. Yeah. Like, do you know what I mean? Like a wee, like a wee show or something like yeah, that. Yeah, have a great. Fucking great. great. Um, uh, I, th- I think one thing about Walk the Line that actually like is much different compared to every other musical is it uses some of the more underplayed Johnny Cash hits like I, I remember the first hit he plays at Folsom Prison that he uses Cocaine Blues mm-hmm. which isn't like a top five Johnny Cash tune it's not like oh you think of Johnny Cash you think Cocaine Blues sure. and it's like just such a good song and I actually kind of like it's just playful whereas like a lot of his songs are kind of like thought to be like oh it's dark it's just about like, like you think about heart when you think of Johnny Cash mm-hmm. a lot of people do anyway I think that's a sort of slightly better side to him yeah I, I like his stuff, but I don't. I, some of it's too religious. Yeah, for me, like he's like I don't like. Oh, his country, isn't he? Yeah, but he's all about Jesus. Getting right with Jesus. Getting right with Jesus. Um, my next one on the worst list is CBGBs, which you haven't seen. I've not seen. Um, do you know? Do you know what CBGBs what, it's is? Probably about the club. Yeah, yeah. So it's a club, and it, like I'm going to put a light on. Does it feature more of like uh, Guns and Roses and stuff like that? No, no, no. So CBGBs. Yeah. So. CBGB's was a club in the Bowery in New York and like the early to late seventies was like when it had its um what's the word? Prominence. So the people that played there are like Ramones, Blondie, Television, Talking Heads, that sort of like new wave stuff. It's such like all those to me like the Ramones when I was growing up the Ramones were like my band, like loved them. Like yeah. so have you ever seen End of the Century? No. It's incredible, like documentary. Uh, the only the only Ramon song I can say that I really really like is the Pet Cemetery. <laughs> Just because it's a great song. It's an anthem. It's a great, it's a great song. That cover in Pet Cemetery I thought was pretty. Yeah, good. it was. It was, it was, the, be- was, it was the best part of the movie. Like for me anyway. Hey, yes, Pet Cemetery is alright. Right, we're digressing now. Right, but to me, End of the Century is a great. It's one of my favorite music documentaries because they're so like this band are basically 
not got much of a following. Well, th- I mean, people wear their t-shirts, but like for a band, it's probably got I think about twelve albums, maybe a bit more. Is there that many? I think it's like eighteen actually. At least. Nah, it's probably about twelve. Um, like they don't have much of a following, but they've got this great story starting from like New York, and like they weren't popular in New York, so they came over to London, and that's like the start of punk. But they're not really punk they're like bubblegum pop with like yeah. this chainsaw guitar on top like just really really interesting story and they all hated so, so each other do they have like any sort of like so it's, I, I know nothing about the Ramones mm-hmm. like do they have like sort of like a catastrophic ending to them did any of them die are they still going no they just kind of they kind of like just faded, faded out faded they, out, they were right. kind of like we're not making money really right. doing this so well no they all had enough money to like keep going but like they were just kind of faded really, out really what I'm thinking is can we go out and write the, the Ramones biopic like and we sell that to like Watch End of the Century. It's on YouTube in like 20 parts, but it's really, really good. But to me, like the Ramones don't really know Blondie's story, like what what that's like. Yeah, I don't, yeah. But like the Dead Boys as well, like one of the first punk bands and t- like television, like they've all got quite interesting stories. Probably could have biopics on their own. So when I heard this was coming out, it was like the story of the Ramones, television, Blondie, blah, 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 Top Neds. I was like, amazing. Like I, I love all that music. Sort of like 70s new wave punk. And then you see it, and there, it's all just like men with like wigs on, right. and like seriously, it's That's like nuts. and like no one plays their own instrument. So when the Ramones got on stage, and the Ramones play a song that they obviously couldn't get the rights to it, so they play a song from like an album from the nineties. Right. This might be in the seventies, and it's just like if you're an actual fan, and you will be because it didn't get a theatrical right. release. So these people that have sought this film out must be big fans. And then you're watching this thing, and it's just not for you. Right. So this isn't a documentary. This is no, no. This, this is, like, this is a, like a recreation. This is, this is a real. This doesn't film. sound like a real film. Yeah. This it's it's really it's not even that because to me like I I love all those bands, love all that music. It's still enjoyable to watch. This this sounds like to me a film that Cameron Crowe will make like almost famous. It's like he's there and he's just experiencing all these things, but none of the facts are quite add up. Well, yeah. Th- this is the thing as well. Like it's ju- it doesn't feel like you've got this plethora of interesting stories and stuff like that to, uh, to have and it's just is it more about like the mood of the place well it's more about um, Hilly Crystal right. who owned it and he was always in debt and he wanted to start CBG because it's country blue grass something like it means the the letters and then it's like OMG something right. uh, they all mean something but he wanted like a blues club and television were the first band to come to him and be like oh we need something to play don't know if you've ever heard television I don't know it's like, all, like alternate like pre-punk like right. And then he started putting on these kind of like more interesting bands. So it's kind of his story about like how he started up the club and how he got these bands to come down. But it's also about like his relationship with his daughter and stuff like that. It's Alan Rickman right. that plays um, Hilly Crystal, but he's just so dull and everyone's so dull. And like that's my main issue with it. It's like all these interesting stories and characters, and he's just doing nothing with them. Right. Like the talking heads get up and play Psycho Killer, but he's only playing an acoustic guitar. So Talking Ed seventy seven the album that Psycho Killers on it's like someone's just hit play and right. these bands this the, these three guys and well two guys and a girl have got up and are just like miming along to it it's just really cringy Rupert Grint what Ron Weasley plays uh, Cheetah Chrome yeah from the Dead Boys who are like one of the like first real like horrible punk bands so and you just look at them and you're like that's not right right that's you know what I mean the the drummer from Foo Fighters is what? Iggy Pop and it. Right. So it's just but, right, but right. So <laughs> at least this also is like weird and kind of like interesting. Whereas like you mm. look at Rocket Man and Premium Rhapsody, which mm-hmm. are so by the book. We're gonna we we've got a story to tell. And yeah. We're only gonna tell it, and we're gonna get all the hits in there as well. Whereas like at least this, it's like it's a bit off kilter. Yeah. It's like trying to actually kind of explain like the the mood of like what these bands were like going through and like what what they were about and like. Just more punk. It n- not really not, though. Not no, really? because that, that's that's an issue with it because right. it doesn't. Yeah, they're in this this club and it's all like the sawdust and right, like okay, there's right. dog shit everywhere. Like that's one of the things that everyone says about it. But it just doesn't. Fe- it doesn't have that that feel like it's like right. gross and grimy and do you know what I mean. So, but I'd rather watch that than Bohemian Rhapsody yeah. for sure because it's yeah there's it's it's slightly more interesting. Just, yeah, it's more interesting, more weird. That editing shot, man, of when they first meet that. What, where it has more cuts than like a Malcolm Bay action scene it's like the whip I've watched like a video on YouTube yeah. and it's like a whip I think, crack I think you that video it's unbelievable and that one best editing Bed, best editing that at the is, Oscars oh, maybe, maybe it is the best editing because that's what they had to work with <laughs> I, I would I would love to see like a re-edit 
of that scene yeah. like, with existing footage. So it's cohesive. Or like a director's cut of Premium Rhapsody just to see if it, Brian Singer from his jail cell just just <laughs> splicing together the film. What was it he got to jail for again? <laughs> Did he actually get put in jail? I don't know. What, what was he accused of? No, they were all thrown out, but he's been accused of several sexual assaults. Right. Mm. It's yeah. no smoke without fire. Maybe you should direct the R. Kelly biopic. I mean, maybe. He's, he's probably got time. He won't be hired for anything now, so... Good ones. I think it's time to talk about Control. Yeah, do it. I'll go in from 24-hour party people from that, so oh, do I, it. I love Control. I love Ian Curtis. I love mm-hmm. Joy Division. I love New Order. They're all part of, like some of my favourite bands. Yeah. Uh, Control is this sort of black and white tour along descent into like the abyss that is Ian Curtis's sort of life, and it's all about his marriage to... Debbie, Deborah, mm-hmm. uh, it's amazing. Uh, I don't like the start, I don't like the first half hour because it's basically Ian Curtis lying on a bed listening to David Bowie. Yeah. It's not a good time. Uh, the moment they meet, uh, was it Tony Tony Wilson. Yes, Tony Wilson Factory Records. It just sort of like gets up from there, and it's, it's such a good it's such a good film. Uh, was it Sam Riley who plays Ian Curtis? Is really personifies his stage presence a lot. He has the sort of wacky rubber arms. Yeah, but it's not comical. It's not comical. It's yeah. not. It's not play for laughs. Whereas, like, I think if it was made now, uh, in a sort of like between the Rhapsody, Rocket Man kind of vibe, people would be laughing. Yeah. At that point, there'd be like a joke made out of it, or like there is a small joke made out of it in Control, where he's like has, he has an epile- he has an epileptic fit, and they go, "Oh, we don't know who won the fight. Was it Ian Curtis?" Yeah, or Ian yeah, Curtis? yeah. But like that kind of makes sense because it's like band banter. At that but point. that's into it as well that's not like the first one he has when he's in the car yeah. so it like makes it yeah exactly what you're saying they're like used to it almost yeah. do you know what I mean they're like making light of it it's just it's just a great wee film mm-hmm. uh, it's, a, it's a hard watch whereas yeah. like, I think that's more what a music biopic should be because mm-hmm. it's, music biopics mostly portray kind of like conflicted characters they play people who are drug addicts people who are into sort of seedier sleazier kind of parts of life uh, I mean see if Rocketman was actually dark and it had like a sort of oppressive atmosphere and it had it was all about Elton John's sort of like escape of that. Mm-hmm. It would have been a lot more interesting. Yeah. Whereas like control is more like the descent into that and the whole idea that it is inescapable. Yeah. And obviously it leads up to the whole like suicide of it and, as well. Uh, and obviously they play uh Lop and Theorist part through it as well, which is just like very poignant at that yeah. point as well. But you, they don't like focus on that. It's not no. like it's not like they've got that in like a montage of his yeah, it, marriage it's, breaking up you know I don't think there's really that much like there's no montages yeah. during the film uh, and there's n- nothing is played for the obvious you know what I mean whereas like everything in new musical biopics are played because it's all about recognition yeah. whereas like this is played because it's I think it was directed by Anton Corbin as well oh, who I don't had, know. he was actually big into he was a uh, he directed music videos for a lot of Depeche Mode right, okay. so he was into that scene for a while so he probably like knew Ian Curtis so he definitely knew Bernard Sumner, who was the guitarist at the mm-hmm. time, he was the main guy from New Order. Uh, so he, he might have had sort of like some personal insight into his sort of like character or story anyway. And at least it had something to tell, you know, it had something to like focus yeah. in on. At that point. I said to you before the podcast, but it's small scale, that's what it's I like about scale. it. And it's like, yeah, the last 20 minutes, see up to the part where he's cremated and yeah. the atmosphere is playing. It's just like, like, that's one of the saddest songs in the world, but it's just like, oh my God. Like, the atmosphere is sad, but like, might not be the saddest Joy Division song. I no, think, like, but I, I, I think it's, it's up there. It's definitely up there. It's up. <laughs> that 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 or ceremony is. Yeah, it's they they do it well. Yeah. They're they're a great band, but it's it's it right. So the final shot of Control uh, has uh, Ian Curtis killed himself on whatever the date was. Mm-hmm. And then has a full stop and says he was twenty three years old, and it's just so kind of like effective at that point because like I, I'm older than that yeah. and I'm like. Holy shit! This 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 character was like so wildly talented, and his yeah. life was cut short, and it was just it's perfect. Yeah, really perfect end. That's that's the fact. That's if I think that's what makes it so effective as well. Most music biopics, you get the start their childhood, yeah. get teenage years, they start the band, it goes well, they reach success, they have the fame and the drugs and yeah. blah blah blah. Well, they're, they're played as heroic. Whereas yeah. like Ian Curtis in Control is not a heroic character. Yeah, but. It's, most music biopics they've got the good part and then they've got the decline yeah or they've got like the, the like they get older but Ian Curtis is like he could have they were ab- they were about to tour America the next yeah. day he could have been fucking huge not that he's not now he's, he's very well known yeah. but and that's one of the saddest parts of it 23 man 23. that is young it's, it's younger than like Morrison yeah like, it's younger than like all these sort of like big acts who actually had like had time to tour it's the same with John Lennon though like John Lennon was young when he died but like also like the Beatles like you don't really notice with the Beatles where like all their albums came out in like a five year stretch. Yeah, yeah. Like if they were allowed to continue, they could have been like they could have been 
a contender. I think they done enough though. They did do enough. But like, seven years. Whereas like, I think Ian Curtis, they had what like, one album, and I think Closer was released posthumously, wasn't it? Yeah. Because uh, like, that's the thing about it, because it's a a crypt. Yeah. The um, cover, and they're the, like, I've watched plenty of documentaries and stuff, and they're all like, "Oh my god, yeah. can we release this?" But it, you know, I think it it's a good tribute. To it, it's just a fan tribute. There's nothing. I don't. The only part I don't like in it is when Bernard hypnotises him. I'm like yeah. a wee bit like this is dipping down a wee bit. It's, it's, it's a little bit on the nose as well. Yeah, but that happened. That did, really did happened. Happen? Yeah, there's a recording of it. Christ. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a weird point in the film as well. It's a turning point because that's like his sort of like affirmation where like I don't want to live anymore. I don't want to be part of this world. I don't want to be like don't want to go to America. I don't want to be part of this marriage. And then the next 20 minutes of the film is just a black hole. Yeah. It's so depressive and it's so hard to actually watch uh, which I think is just completely different to the music and biopics that we've had for the past 10 years. Sure. Uh, I think this came out the year after Walk the Line, and mm-hmm. Walk the Line was the sort of precursor to what we were going to get with Rocket Man and Bohemian Rhapsody, but like Control kind of stands by itself, and it's like such a nice, well I say nice, but it's such a good monument to yeah. like what the person was like. Yeah, it's really, it's it's great, and like when you pair it with the book, like they're both, yeah. they go hand in hand together. Companion pieces. Uh, I think also as well, like you've got the two sort of central performances of Sam Riley and Matthew Morton and they're just stand out yeah. cracking. they're both great and both like really understated yeah. and like it's just a smaller scale film. it's a bit like um, England is mine yeah. but because England mine is terrible do you know what I mean it's it's I, smaller but I, I like how during control like uh, Ian Carter steps out of his house and then walks two seconds to his job in the employment office yeah. and then he like uh, finishes his job and he walks two minutes to like the pub where he like plays yeah. and it's like it's Manchester's a big city, but like it's not in this film. Yeah, yeah. Not. What's good in that part as well is that he's wearing his trench coat that says "Hate" on the back in Tipex, and um, he like gets. He, you can see the building, and he lights up another cigarette just before he walks in. Probably takes like two draws of it and like things it away because he was such a heavy smoker. Yeah. So I think it's they done a really really good job at like because he, he he was a dick, was but a dick. you can't have a film, especially this musical hero, yeah. and just show him to be a total. That's what the doors does so wrong right. because he, Jim Morrison was a total prick by yeah. like all accounts, but he wasn't like the the wild the wild man like he's portrayed well, in that film. He wasn't like he, he's he's seen as being this huge poet. Yeah, but like I, I don't think he really is in the doors. Like he's yeah. kind of a buffoon in, in the doors a wee bit. Yeah, well, like, yeah, exactly. He's like there's a party like pisses on a waitress and stuff like that, and like maybe that did happen, maybe. but not in the way it's shown in the film. Where like yeah, he's like spouting poetry one second and then the next he's like Pete like I can't believe that that's the same person so just to clarify The Doors is definitely on your hate list yeah well I'll, I'll, I'll get to it but I want to do 24 hour party people right, 24 hour party people what is amazing about 24 hour party people so 24 again it's just this, I, I watched it when I was younger I taped it off of Channel 4 it was one of those ones that was on late at night and like I just wore out the tape like right. just rewatched it just because it was before I liked Joy Division and stuff like that so it got it got me into that um, it's the main story is Tony Wilson yeah. but like Factory Records them starting up and then their decline it's like the Hacienda Manchester sort of like rave music coming into the culture it's, it's, it's like such <clears> a <throat> such a very particular time yeah. in Britain like during the 90s yeah. especially like it's with, dark as fuck yeah. but not sort of like comic there's a part where like it's talking about gun crime and it's got kids like cycling through the street like shooting people like maybe that did happen yeah. but it is slightly comical like a lot more than control yeah. but um, it just it tells a really like interesting story of Tony Wilson he was already this TV presenter but then he like decided to start this club up and Joy Division came to play and like The Fall were playing and stuff like that and then from there they started Factory Records and then it's got Suicide Ian Curtis yeah. and then it's got him managing I guess the Happy Mondays and like what came from that and then the Hacienda and stuff like that it's just a great little British music film yeah, do you know what I mean it's it's, it does amazing probably the budget was like a couple of million I it, think, it must you know like when when was Al, when was Steve Coogan like getting big? It must have been like sort of mid nineties, surely. What like Alan Partridge? Yeah, yeah, yeah like early to mid nineties. Yeah, so yeah. it's like he wouldn't have been like taking that much of a cut at that point, surely. It must have been like a passion project, if anything. Yeah, definitely. Um, just really, Tony Wilson like as a character is really really interesting. The music's all throughout it is really really great. Um, there's a lot of like cameos from people that were in the Happy Mondays and um, like Tony Wilson's in it himself and stuff like that. It's just some of it's a bit silly. Um, it's got yeah. quite a lot of like British like dry humour and like sarcastic humour. It's probably maybe not for everyone. But but at least it is interesting. Whereas like other films kind of play just get the hits, yeah. get get the story out. Get, at least at least twenty four hour people is a bit weird. Have you seen that? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I mean I've not seen it in like ten years. Yeah. Like, 
from what I remember of it, it was just weird. Yeah, I'd be surprised if he can get it on DVD, but yeah. if he can, a hundred percent. If you like that sort of like British, a lot of drug culture. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's the whole fact like he takes yeah. cocaine and he's got this. It's one of my favourite lines. He gets stuck out in the snow and he's got this mobile phone, but obviously in the he's the, the huge. But yeah, it was like a brick, and he says, "I was trying to use this fucking mobile phone, and it sounded like listening to a fucking headache." <laughs> and I've said that so many times, and people are like, "What does a headache sound like?" And I'm like, "Doesn't, doesn't you're, you're not yeah. some twenty four hour party people." But yeah, but just very, very good. There's always one scene that sticks out to me, but is when Ian Curtis has his epileptic fit on stage, and Hookie, who's played by Ralph Little, right. um, like helps him out, and he like takes this. He's like wearing a shirt. And he like takes the cigarettes out of his pocket. Like he obviously, it, it's as if he's not meant to care yeah. that his friend, his close friend, is having a epileptic fit. See, I, I feel that like twenty four hour party people can go hand in hand as like a companion piece to like train spotting. Mm-hmm. Like I think it's just like there's, there's a lot of debauchery. Yeah. There's just a lot of like weird kind of stuff that happens, and it's just it's a good, it's just a weird film. Yeah, love it. Very very good. I would highly recommend it to everyone. Have you got another? No, I, th- I think I've covered it. just about everything I want to cover it, to be honest. Right, well, The yeah. Doors, I, I, I don't like it. There's not much to really... I, I do like it because it's got Val Kilmer in it, who's very hard not to like, in my opinion. Right, Val Kilmer is amazing. And he, he, looks, he looks like Jim Morrison. He does look like Jim Morrison. Yeah. He does. But everyone, it's got that whole thing where it's like, it looks like a few of the actors have just shoved on wigs yeah. and been pushed out in front of the camera I, and been I, like, I th- act crazy. I think that's very uh, evident with uh, Kyle McLachlan as Ray, Ray Mandrick. Yes. It looks like he's wearing a fake moustache yeah. half the film. He looks he looks weird enough already. Yeah, definitely. Um, there's that part where they're in they're all having dinner and Jim's like freaking out as he's giving his Pam into it. Yeah. Um he's like freaking out in front of Pam and um Ray, the keyboard player, like shakes him but he's like, Jim, what are you doing, man? And I'm just like, Oh my god, it's like that is a caricature, like you've not been directed well. No. But like this was like was this before or after Platoon for Alverstone? Oh, I don't, I, it must have been after. Must have been after. Surely. So, so, like, so there's a whole thing where like directors will go off and make sort of this very like, visceral, gritty film, mm-hmm. and then we'll go off and make something just a bit more lighthearted. Yeah. And maybe that's what the doors was for like Alverstone. Yeah, I, it's obviously a passion project yeah. as well. Like obviously like a huge fan, but it's just it's probably not the film they deserve to be honest. It's no. weird that he's got a film. <gasps> have you ever seen Hendrix? No, Hendrix is fucking shit. I should have added that. <laughs> Another, they didn't get the rights to any of his music, so right. he just kind of plays blues guitar. Oh, this guy sucks. from Outcast, okay. what uh, Andre? Andre, Andre yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really, really bad. Does but he, does he plays Hendrix. He yeah. plays Hendrix. Yeah. That's mental. It's it was on Netflix about three years ago. It's I, still I, I can imagine. Uh, I can imagine Miss Jackson in the style of Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> That's what I want to listen to. <laughs> well, they didn't have the they play. Um, there's this there's this famous story apparently where Hendrix heard um, Sergeant Pepper's right. Lonely Hearts Club Band, and he just he heard it one time, right. like bought it that day, and then like performed it live. That's the only song you get to see him like play. As... I, I, did, I didn't realize that was a story. Wow. Yeah, uh, it was an interesting story. It's uh, cool. But that's the only song you actually get to hear him play. I, I, I'd be really interested to see like how many of these stories are actually like fact though. Mm-hmm. Like I, I feel like that's what biopics are. They're yeah. just they're just based on myth. Like, yeah, oh, 100%, yeah, 100%. Oh, shit. It's like, I didn't mention uh, Love and Mercy. Love and Mercy is like one of my favourite musical uh-huh. movies. I love it. I love Paul Dano. Yeah, well, his part's very, very good. His part's are very good. That's all you needed. I don't like John Cusack. You needed, you don't like him as an actor. What? I like him in Con Air. Ah, he's great in Con Air. I, I like him in like all driving his... Driving like, that car, man. It's fucking great. <laughs> Just driving a car. Uh, I love him <laughs> in all his like nerdy action films, like mm-hmm. 2012. Yeah. That kind of thing. Whereas like in Love and Mercy, he plays uh, Brian Wilson just as like a child yes I, I find him to be too mentally unstable for yeah. that role he's a bit of a cat he's a bit of a like a I'm not going to like pretend to no, be that's, that's, yeah, that, but that's, that's very much on on the cuff for like good taste yeah but that's that's what I, when I watch it I'm like you're just pretending it's like yeah. um, Eddie Redmayne as Stephen Hawking yeah. you're just doing an impression of someone that has some has sort a, of has, issue yeah has like mental deficiencies yeah do you know what I mean so that's and fun. Should that be praised? No, it definitely should not. Whereas, like Paul Dano as Brian Wilson is like the sort of like misunderstood yeah. kind of genius who just gets into like LSD and all yeah. sorts and like obviously schizophrenic and like so it's just a great great film. You know? That part, yes. Yeah. The pet sounds recording should have been the film, the two hour film, because that is a two hour. I could watch a two hour story on that. Yeah, that's, that's just true. Like even just a documentary, like of it. Yeah. Uh, why not just have that? Um, yeah. Straight out of Compton. Straight out of Compton. It's my last good one. It's good. It's just, it's just, it's just, just a good film. I'm not a big rap guy. No. I don't know if you can tell, but it's like 
it's a good introduction into like their band and their yeah. story and it, there's a lot going on in it like it's not just it's not they're not put on a pedestal of all being good people right they're not good people right but they are definitely on a pedestal like ah uh, right fair the, enough the, the, yeah. the, the whole Ice Cube being like the founding father of NWA and the whole thing where it's like he wrote like 90% of the lyrics yeah. to all their songs is maybe a little bit suspect and I think like it's hard because obviously he's a producer on it so is Dr. Dre yeah. and Dr. Dre is treated as like this sort of genius sort of beat person yeah 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 uh, and I, f- I feel like because EZ like, isn't alive anymore I feel like maybe there's like some other members that aren't like vocal yeah. in industry that it's very easy just to say I am this genius yeah. and I think that's where I have some issues with it yeah well there is there is a member I think it's Doc is, or something is, like is that it, is DOC yeah, yeah he, he, I, he had like a big he was like I was a much bigger part of yeah. it I'm kind of forgotten in the film same with like MC Ren yeah, like, yeah. I, I feel like there may be bigger parts to it than they are but it is is he dead is it? I don't know. Probably. It, it's like, I, I don't want to assume. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, but like, I, I feel like Ice Cube is maybe like taking it on like, it's, it's, it's the Ice, Ice Cube the movie. Yeah, but I, I I really like, I would have, it's quite long, it's like two hours 20. Yeah. Um, but I, I really like, I think like, it's the bit with Dr. Dre is on the date and it, like his girlfriend says, oh, what about the rape charge? Do you know what I mean? They don't, yeah totally like shy away from it and be like oh no he was he was lovely to women what are like yeah. what are you talking about obviously it, they were all horrible people I, I, I feel like easy dies of AIDS really really fast yeah like he gets it and then like two minutes later he's just gone yeah well the, again like maybe this did happen but the bit he collapses as well is like kind of comical there's it's like the le- the last like 20 minutes he's in the film it's kind of a case of it cuts to him and he's coughing yeah and then it's like Oh, he's, he's got AIDS. Do you know what I mean? He's got full like it's it just it, it romps along too fast. I feel like it was maybe a story where they tried to tell too much. Mm-hmm. Like maybe they should have ended it prior to like him dying of AIDS. Maybe yeah. like it's the big reveal at the end is he just has it. He's not yeah, got, yeah, he's yeah. not got long left. Do you know what I mean? Like there's there's, sto- there's a story enough of their rise to fame that they could have ended it when they were big. You know yeah, I mean? yeah, they could have yeah. just been rags to riches instead of rags to riches to like some people just dying. Yeah, there's a bit with Ice Cube as well when he comes to the hospital and he's like, oh, I, I can't see him. I'm like, that probably didn't happen. No. But and you're just like, you like it's as if he can't go into the room to yeah. bear to see like his friend unwell, but it's more like he you probably just him. didn't actually come exactly. to the hospital. He probably, probably you know didn't I mean? care. Like, yeah. uh, I think when EZ died, like it was when Dr. J was huge. It was like when The Chronic came out. Yeah. He was a sole artist at that point. Like, Speaking of AIDS movies, have you seen Behind the Candelabra? No. It is a musical biopic about... Who is that? Uh, Liberace. Oh my God. It's great. Did he die of AIDS? Yeah. <laughs> Famously died of AIDS. Didn't know that. You did not? Uh-huh. No. Is it good though? Would you it, it, is, it is fantastic. It's... Uh, like, Michael, du- Michael Douglas plays... In a funny way? No, it's 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 really dark. Right, uh, okay. But it is it's played for comic affairs. It's, it's kind of like the film that I wish Bimi Rhapsody was. Right. Where like, it is more about his sort of life... Uh, it's about him sort of like joining up with a partner who is like Liberace kind of controls him a lot uh, but also Liberace is kind of like the character I wish Freddie Mercury was where like he is very calculating he's a, he's a smart guy he's mm-hmm. a genius uh, he knows exactly what he's up to at any given point and he knows that the trajectory he's on is going to kill him but he right. doesn't care anyway and he just goes for it and like, hit, like head first whereas like I feel like Freddie Mercury in Bohemian Rhapsody is like mm-hmm. well it's not my fault, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's very childish. She's like, I'm gonna have all these mad sex parties, mm-hmm. and I'm gonna be fine. Yeah, but you never see it. This is the thing. You never this, see it. This is the thing that Sasha Baron Cohen wanted to do. He wanted to do the parties where dwarfs were walking around with silver plates yeah. of cocaine on them. That's like, pro- that's probably R rated. But and that did happen though. Yeah. I, like apparently, like I, I wasn't there, so I don't know. But that's what he wanted to do when he was playing them. And th- what we got was like a twelve A family film. Yeah, a feel good film. Well, it's, it's more about the band than it is Freddie Mercury at that point. Is it, though? Is it? Well, I feel like the band are in it a lot. Brian, I, what did you learn about Brian May? Nothing, but he was in it. Yeah. He was in it a huge amount. Because they, they produced it. I, they, just, I just remember his hair. Yeah. His hair, uh, what is it? The Who's the bassist called? What's the bassist called in Queen? John Deacon. John no, Deacon. is it Jim Deacon or John Deacon? The, whatever it is, he's played by the wee kid from Jurassic Park. Yes, That's it's all incredible. I think. Yeah. But there must be a connection there, like, between, like... Um, what's his name the fucking paedophile Brian <laughs> why do you think I'm knowledgeable of people the, fucking, with, the guy we were talking X-Men Brian oh Brian Singer uh, Brian Singer yeah Brian Singer and Steven Spielberg there must be some sort of there must be yeah I don't know I don't want to think into that no, too much definitely not. No. Let's, but, not, um, let's not think about it what were we even talking about I don't know any biopics you want to see 
Biopics, uh, yeah, definitely. Sonic Youth is a big one. I would, mm-hmm. I would love to see Sonic Youth. Who biopics. would you like? How would that even work? But I don't know. I, th- I think you, I think a documentary would work. A better. documentary would work. Maybe yeah. like a, a, a few parts. I think if you were to do a biopic of the band, I think you focus on obviously Thurston Moore and Kim Gordon. Mm-hmm. I, would, I would look at their marriage and their, their sort of a relationship. Maybe just have Lee Ronaldo kicking about. Was was it Steve Shelley? The, oh, do you know better than me? Man? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty no sure idea. Steve Shelley. Uh, just they're a weird bunch. Like it's weird to have a band so productive. And so different each album, like, uh, yeah, and especially recently as well. With I think Kim Gordon's just getting divorced from mm-hmm. Thurston Moore as well. Like, some some stuff must be going down. I want to know more about that. Yeah, I think a documentary is more the way to go yeah. for that. What about you? What, what's what's about it? Like, I'd watch? I'd like to see a Ramones one would be good. Like a real like, yeah. but not the thing is like end of the, end of the century is it's got everything. Who would you cast as Johnny Ramone? Because I know who I would cast as Thurston Moore. Adam Driver would be good Adam Driver would be good because he's kind of like tall and yeah. a bit gangly so I'm also thinking about tall and gangly guys yeah. I'm thinking of uh, do you know Caleb Landry Jones who's that he's did you watch The Dead Don't Die yeah so he's the, the comic book owner oh he's great I love yeah, him he's yeah, yeah yeah he's, 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 good. he's, he's the guy is from, he tall I don't know if he's tall but like mm. I think he's got the look he's, he's, he's great man he's, he's in Get Out he's good in Get Out yeah he's the brother and he's in uh, guy, first like, class yeah he's like do you like MMA yeah yeah, yeah. I don't know and he's like wrestling <laughs> him at the family table it's great. yeah he's great man. I think, I I think he's, he's enough of a character that he could pull off yeah. that, that he persona. needs like he needs his breakout yeah he, he needs he needs a Remy Malik being your absolute yeah, that's what yeah. he needs and that could be it that Sonic could be it um, I think I'll we'll call it quits there because we've both got work we've got to go to work we've got yeah. to go pay some bills sick it's a sick world yeah but thank you very much for coming on it probably will be Alan again next week maybe he's happy to do it I'm, I've, I've got nothing better to I do can tell life. by your face yeah so follow us on all the good stuff YouTube Spotify Instagram we've got a Facebook group now all that good stuff you got Twitter yeah Calum deals, deals with the Twitter Calum deals with the Twitter he does the tweets right. so yeah we will see you again next week right goodbye bye bye